Seek Account Manager with uh, Synergist. And uh, before we get started on today's uh, webcast, which is uh, Fusion Lifecycle Part 3, uh, focused on quality management, I'll go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this is Part 3, so there are recordings available if you happen to not catch the, the first two parts of this series. Um, you can always find that up on the uh, Synergist blog site or up on our website. If you need any help finding these, please uh, let us know and we can direct you there. Uh, this webcast will also be recorded and uh, we'll be sending you a link to the, uh, the recording via email as soon as it's processed. Uh, during the webcast, please don't hold your questions. Type them into the, the panel, the question uh, panel on the GoToMeeting. Um, so then what we'll do is if we can field them, if I'm able to field them during the go-to meeting, I will do my best. If not, we will answer those. Uh, we'll leave probably about 10, 15 minutes at least for uh, question and answer at the end. So questions are, are highly, um, uh, yeah, my, the word is escaping me. We want your questions. <laughs> anyway, so if... Uh, all right, without further delay, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Scott Stewart, who's going to be presenting today. Uh, Scott is our PLM application consultant with Synergist, and uh, I'll let uh, Scott run the show. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fusion Lifecycle webinar on quality management. Again, this is the final part of a three-part series on Fusion Lifecycle. I'd just like to quickly thank you for taking the time today to attend Again, my name is Scott Stortz. I am the PLM Application Consultant here at Synergist. I've been here for a few months now at Synergist, uh, having spent the previous 20 years as an engineer in a variety of different manufacturing companies. Uh, my last employer, I led a successful PLM software deployment, and that's ultimately what led me here to my position at Synergist. And today I'm hosting the webinar from our offices in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. Uh, the webinar should last about 40 minutes, um, give or take. We're not going to take the full hour of your time today, hopefully. And again, like Dave had indicated, there is a question and answer session at the end of the seminar. If you do have questions, please use the chat panel. We'll try to answer them throughout, but if not, we will certainly get to them at the dedicated question and answer session at the end. And with that, let's get started. Uh, so hopefully most of you are aware at this point, but if not, uh, what used to be called PLM 360 is now called Fusion Lifecycle. Uh, it is still the same PLM software offered from Autodesk. It's now just been rolled into the uh, Autodesk single technology platform, their product innovation platform. It is all of Autodesk uh, cloud-connected tools. Uh, the advantage of the cloud-connected tools are hopefully clear to most people at this point in time. The lower cost, lower complexity, higher performance, uh, instant access to new features and updates taken care of for you automatically. Product innovation software such as CAD and PLM uh, have lagged behind other applications like CRM and ERP moving into the cloud. That's where Autodesk kind of saw an opportunity here and developed the first and only end-to-end -end cloud product innovation platform. And you can see the three components there, Fusion 360, Fusion Lifecycle, and, and what is now called Fusion Connect. Uh, what I think is great here for myself and, and for potential customers is that Autodesk really sees this as the future of this whole uh, cloud-connected product innovation platform, and they're really spending a lot of emphasis and development on these products. So what is Fusion Lifecycle and Product Lifecycle Management? Broad set of processes used to create, maintain, communicate product information from ideation to end of life. Uh, essentially connects and organizes people and information involved in these processes in order to improve the effectiveness and value of all of those processes in your business. So why are we here? Uh, basically business process improvement. Uh, more specifically, today's webinar is going to focus on quality management. Uh, the first two focus on new product introduction or stage gate management. And the second uh, see in the part in the series was items build of materials and change management. And today we are discussing quality management. So fusion life cycle saves time and money, right? So I assume everyone here uh, Attending the webinar today can identify some level of waste in their processes and would like to have more value added work being done and less waste in their systems. I guess the challenge becomes finding how do we do that? How do we become more effective and efficient in these processes and systems? 
And I think uh, in reference to quality processes and quality management, I would say you know searching and data entry are two of the bigger ones from my experience. Um, quality seems to be one of those areas where, in my experience, has often operated in somewhat of a silo, not intentionally, but just by the nature of the departments and organizations that I've worked in, the quality group kind of was an isolated group of people, and, and the way their processes were set up, they were kind of isolated. So searching for that information, understanding that information, and then once you got that information, re-entering it into either a change request or change order at that time were often areas that I've struggled with in my career to get, you know, where my organization started to be really efficient in our quality management processes. So fusion life cycle, and how does it help with that, you know, and all PLM softwares really. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to take processes that are currently at a level one, level two, where they're largely manual, maybe a little bit organized, maybe you're using network drives with Excel files or Word documents and things like that. And those processes obviously are led with delays and mistakes because you're just not accessing the correct information and you're trying to get them to a level three, level four um, with using PLM as the tool to do that. This improves efficiency and accuracy and certainly reduces stress and frustration for you know not having to always answer questions. You know, being an engineer for the past 20 years, you know, having questions on where these things stand was a, a constant struggle throughout the, my daily life as an engineer. And, and PLM really delivered a, a tremendous change in that aspect. Uh, it was a change that you know, I certainly underestimated at the time uh, when we implemented PLM. I was the main driver behind that PLM, so when we fully realized that change, it was really more dramatic than I expected once we got our processes into this level three, level four type scenario. So why Fusion Lifecycle versus other PLM softwares? Uh, first is it's a complete cloud solution. It was designed to be easy to use, and it really truly is an easy to use software. The interface is nice and clean and simple. It's very flexible. The workflow management and creation and then the different features you can do is specifically with workflows and modifying the forms and the fields is very flexible. It is, you know, designed up front to be accessible from mobile devices. It's, you know, an Android and uh, Apple compatible for your mobile devices and fastest time to value. Um, a lot of that fast time to value is based on not having to do software updates, not having to do hardware updates and all the costs associated with that. Uh, that really leads to tremendous return on value in a much quicker time frame for Fusion Lifecycle. In specific reference to that, uh, you know, an on-premise PLM solution does have a lot of hidden costs. Hidden costs that kind of bit me at my last employer uh, as the person responsible for our PLM system. And we got it up and running and about a year in, we wanted to do some minor updates that you know, just some bug fixes and some minor software updates, but that had to be done taking the system down over the weekend, getting consultants in, and essentially doing an entirely new software install. That cost in excess of $20,000, and then, so we got that through, but then a year later when we wanted to do it again, and it was a bigger software update because there's now some uh, feature enhancements and things like that, uh, but we also now needed to do some of the additional software updates, like the SQL server updates and the, and the Microsoft server update, um, that cost was even higher. Now it was like thirty, forty thousand dollars for that update. So having to do those types of costs every year on top of the licensing, you know, is really something I know I personally underestimated with non-premise solution and, and something that Fusion Lifecycle doesn't have since it is cloud-based and all that kind of stuff is taken care of for you. Another big thing with Fusion Lifecycle is it has been designed uh, up front to be built for integration. A lot of customers integrate PLM with other systems. Uh, Fusion Lifecycle's API, the middleware, make that easy to build, you know, fast, reliable, and easy to maintain integrations with things like PDM, ERP, and CRMs. Uh, an important note here, too, is you can integrate Fusion with cloud and on-premise softwares. This is kind of a busy slide, but what is trying to be highlighted here is that Fusion Lifecycle comes with a whole bunch of pre-built apps in all the areas that you see there, and, and then a bunch of apps addition to those even. And all those apps have pre-configured information, pre-configured workflows and forms and things like that that give you a really good starting point for all of those areas of your business and all of that is included in your licensing. Simply have to download it, install it, get it up and running, 
and you have a starting point ready to go. There's no added cost. There's no software to purchase and configure. I mean, you want to configure it for your specific needs, but it is available to you from day one at no additional cost. You know, with my old system, all the models were additional licensing costs, and you know, essentially the whole system had to be taken down, reinstalled, and reconfigured with whatever model you would add, which obviously was a, a big time and IT and cost burden to do that. Fusion lifecycle, all these models are available to you from day one, and you can install them when you're ready and as you go along in your deployment of PLM. So quality management, that's today's topic. Uh, manufacturing organizations have all the same goal. Once they've developed an initial idea, they want to be able to take that idea through the various stages of development and come to the end of the process with a high quality product that's delivered on time and on budget, right? Ultimate goal is to deliver the right product at the right time to a satisfied customer. In order for product development to be successful, there's a lot of activities that need to take place between the idea of the product and delivery. And quality needs to be kind of be continually monitored throughout that process. Those activities need to be efficient and coordinated across the whole organization. Um, normally there's a new product introduction process that's followed throughout the development cycle. That was phase one of this three-part series. Um, underneath that, there are many sub-processes and tasks and teams and activities that need to be carried out during that new product introduction process. And all this requires a large amount of product-related information uh, to be available to stakeholders to make well-informed decisions. And understanding quality of the product is essential throughout that entire process. So that being understood, I think everybody kind of understands that and can relate to that, but what are some of the causes of poor quality. I think first and foremost, the most common issue is bad information. People often find it difficult to obtain the data they need to do their jobs effectively, and they can be unsure once they've found it that it's you know, valid and correct and current information. It leads to decisions being taken based on incorrect or unclear information, which inevitably leads to some quality issues somewhere downstream. Um, poor upfront planning procedures is another cause, for example, inefficient processes for planning item inspections. I know that that was a challenge for us at my last employer. You know, when we're leading up to a new product introduction and getting the first article inspection scheduled and which components need to have the first article inspections versus which will carry over, all that stuff. You know, it was very difficult to plan prior to PLM. So having procedures in place to deal with issues and resolve them with engineering changes, you know, as an example, it's kind of disjointed and it's, you know, and after the fact it's a reactionary process. So that, you know, Often these processes cause delays and, and additional costs on the back end. Um, so lack of traceability, too, is another cause of poor quality. Historical information is difficult to find. This can also lead to difficulty in the auditing and being compliant and a lack of understanding of whether the products and the components conform you know, to the legislation if you have that in your business, if there's legislation requirements of, for your product. Other process, other possible cause of poor quality outlined here is Product requirement dictated both by customers and legislation not always being widely visible and understood, and suppliers not being managed effectively in terms of quality in their processes, in their communication, and general lack of visibility of up-to-date metrics related to quality levels. So costs of poor quality, uh, there can be internal costs, which you know is scrap, rework, non-value added activities caused by these quality issues, which is often a large amount of time and effort to rectify these issues. External costs, which are incurred after the product has reached the customer, and these are often you know, far more expensive than internal ones. Um, warranty claims, visit the customer sites to rectify the issues, product recalls, all that stuff can be really costly and time consuming. You know, and the external issues, you know, quality and the quality management stuff is forced into a very reactionary mode. Uh, which is very difficult for everyone to then manage you know, efficiently and well. Um, the cost of not conforming to regulation can also be huge, both in terms of legal costs and also, again, the effort required to bring processes and procedures into line. Uh, but more importantly, there's a risk of lost revenue due to, for example, being unable to sell certain products into a particular market until they're proven to conform. Um, my last employer, we sold boilers uh, throughout North America, and we had unique requirements for Canada and other regions throughout the United States, and understanding those requirements was very difficult um, because we never had a centralized location prior to PLM to store that information and, and associate to the actual products themselves and make sure that we were adhering to that. PLM really gave us a tool to, to get that information much more visible to us and, and avoid that 
challenge uh, much better than we were able to in the past. Um, so the net result of all of the poor quality really is a significant amount of direct cost and time wasted. Perhaps the biggest risk though is you know, loss of sales and, and you know, loss of your reputation with the customer. So PLM uh, helps bring these issues to just outline. It helps bring together all the information process associated with all those stages of a product life cycle from initial requirements, definition capture, to in service and, and even beyond. Therefore, it provides a single up-to-date version of the truth around a product or design project for all stakeholders across the organization. This can reduce the impact of all the aforementioned issues and also allow visibility into quality during the entire life cycle process. So how does PLM help do that you know, in terms of quality? And how does it help you know, improve quality specific issues? First, improve compliance and traceability. Any process that can be managed within PLM, whether it's part of an engineering change procedure or one directly related to quality, such as nonconformance or any other process involved in getting products to market. These processes are fully traceable in PLM and can be easily accessed and referred to if required for auditing purposes, for example, long after they've been completed, long after you know, people have kind of forgotten you know, where that issue stood and what process they went through. Similarly, an audit process required can themselves be managed and any information related to them can be recorded for future use. So both these capabilities lead to much faster, more accurate internal and third-party auditing. Items managed in PLM, whether they're component parts, sub-assemblies, or whole products, can be assigned conformity flags for any standards so that stakeholders can see whether or not each item's conformity has been confirmed, and if not, something can be done about it in an appropriate amount of time. Uh, certainly helps ensure fully conforming products get out the door faster without last-minute firefighting, you know, when somebody does realize that, you know, maybe we haven't adhered to you know, a certain uh, requirement. Also, product requirements can be managed in PLM and made widely visible throughout that product's life cycle. The whole team can also see whether these requirements have been met whether they're stipulated by the customer or whether it's a legislative compliance or whatever your compliance need is. Again, this helps to ensure the requirements are understood and being met without any last minute uh, surprises and costly delays at late stage in the project. Next area where PLM really helps is providing a way to make decisions based on more accurate information. Uh, essentially, the main aspect of this is around visibility of information, information that's known to be accurate and up to date. Uh, instead of searching around endlessly on network drives and folders, you know, go to the single source of the truth in PLM. It provides you know, product-related data, but in particular interest here is easy access to information such as non-conforming items, field inspections, field data reports, customer requirements and comments, and approved suppliers. It has a great benefit in the fact that when the build materials and assemblies are viewed by anyone, they're informed whether an item within it is subject to a current engineering change or if there's an issue in the field on that part or sub-assembly. Capabilities like this work to reduce the risk of downstream errors uh, due to wrong information or wrong version of data being accessed, or people, you know, accessing wrong information about change and ordering large quantities of component whose design is about to be modified. You know, I can say as an engineer, this this happened to me a lot. Where we're getting we're scrambling, a problem happens in the field. We have to get the, the part corrected right away. It's a real urgent situation, and in in the process of that, maybe we forgot to inform procurement and other personnel to, to put this part on hold until we get the problem dealt with. So in, in the meantime, we're dealing with our uh, engineering changes. We get it through, we get it to procurement, and now all of a sudden procurement says, well, we just ordered a couple hundred of those parts. And so what do we do now? And you know, that, that was a very common thing. And, and having this all this information tied in PLM really helps give you a tool to help prevent that kind of uh, situation from occurring. Uh, and comprehensive reporting capabilities of PLM also gives you a way to you know, provide metrics and, and analyze them. Um, the nice thing about PLM reporting, too, is it's real-time. So everything you access will be real-time. It's not relied on a, a manual update of a spreadsheet or something like that. So not just the quality department, but the entire wider audience can view these reports and metrics and see you know, what is happening in real-time. One area I want to touch on is having to manage invisible processes. Uh, PLM offers the ability to manage process workflows and, and really a critical thing that I'm trying to highlight throughout today's presentation is that we can join these processes together intelligently. So we can create a fully linked closed loop process to manage issues right through the completed engineering change. Uh, this is a much smoother and more accurate information flow 
across all the different processes. A good example of another of the process we can manage is the corrective and preventative, uh, corrective and preventative actions, or TAPA. Managing this in PLM makes it visible and traceable, but also just having it available in PLM helps meet compliance requirements for those organizations where there's a need to prove that that process is actually in place. Uh, there are many examples where managing processes and making them more widely visible in PLM can help improve quality. Uh, two additionally worth mentioning are inspection planning and making the part of the quality chain more efficient and supplier management review, uh, which enables organizations to keep track of the review cycles of their suppliers and help ensure they're getting the best value, but more importantly, best quality output from their supply chain. Core key, core PLM capabilities. Again, today we're talking about quality. In these uh, first two sessions, we talked about one NPI, the new product introduction or stage state process. And the second one, we talked about building materials and change management. And then again, today we're talking about quality. But quality is one of the core functional capabilities of PLM. Uh, before we kick off the software demonstration, just wanted to give an overview of the fusion life cycles workspaces and how they relate to each other. And this is, you know, fusion lifecycle workspaces as it comes out of the cloud, if you will. Uh, and what I'm trying to demonstrate here or, or highlight is just, you know, what, how all the workspaces can be interconnected together. And then the first of the three series, we talked about new product introduction again. And the second, we talked about items, building materials, and change management. And these workspaces highlighted in blue. And today, we're talking about the three workspaces highlighted in green as the quality management workspaces. It doesn't have to be set up this way, but again, this is just how what you can get right out of the cloud and, and have set up for you, you know, is a good starting point. And, and I think what I really wanted to show here is how all these workspaces can be connected together. And I think we're going to go through some examples that will explain this a little bit better. An example specifically that we're going to go through is how an RMA can generate or be associated to a Kappa. That Kappa can generate a change request, that change request can generate a change order. That change order then is connected to an item, bills of materials, and the revisions in that items and bills of materials, and obviously then that rolls up into the final sellable product to the customer. So with that, I want to give a brief uh, demonstration of the software itself. And I'm just going to jump right into some of the quality areas of the software you're going to go into the workspaces. So what we're looking at here on the left side is just some general categories of workspaces. And then here in this menu is the actual individual workspaces themselves. I'm going to start with a non-conformance workspace. And in this case, we're just going to look at this first one as an example for a non-conformance report that we have in here. What we're using in our demonstration tenant is a live uh, fusion lifecycle tenant, just like you would be using at your customer site or as, as you as a customer. And it is preloaded with a, a demonstration data set. It consists of NVIDIA graphics cards and stuff like that. Um, so it is, this is exactly like you would be seeing it at your facility. Uh, and in case of this non-conformance report that we're looking at here, what I wanted to highlight is that we have in this non-conformance report, you know, a summary section. In this summary section, we have a direct link to the supplier being affected by this non-conformance report and a direct connection to the non-conforming item in, in this non-conformance report. And furthermore, down here, we have an approval team. There's two stages of the approval process in this case. I'm going to show you the workflow in a second. But this approval team can be set for each one of these. You know, so in some cases, you can have certain personnel. In other cases, you might want to have different personnel associated to the non-conformance report and who does the review stage and the disposition stage. It's very easy to set up and select the people responsible for the different stages of this approval process. And here in the reference field, there's a related CAPA. In this case, we don't have a CAPA associated to this. But if there was a CAPA associated to this non-conformance report, that would be shown here. And it would all be directly connected together. In terms of the workflow, again, this is, so each workspace has the ability to have its own configured workflow. And this is the workflow we have set up for this non-conformance area. Uh, right now, we are in this green box in the end of review stage. And we can have the choice of going back to the create or going forward to disposition stage. And then you see later on, we have the choice of creating a kappa or, or closing this out. Another area I wanted to highlight here is the attachments tab. Now, one of the areas that I've struggled with in the past with processes that were managed and things like Excel and other 
things, how do you then associate additional files to that? In this case, we just have an image file here of you know, the, this non-components report. What's happening is there is a you know, scratch on the component. Um, so we just have a, a quick image file that's associated there, but this file can be checked out uh, and updated. There's a version history here for that file. And that can be anything. It can be Word, PDF, Excel, whatever you want it to be. So it really provides the ability for you to associate additional or attach additional information into things like a non-conformance report and keep all of that information connected and controlled together in one location uh, so you don't lose track of that type of information. Something I'm gonna, so I'm going to create a new non-conformance report quick just to highlight some of the features of the software. And the first thing I want to highlight here is you know, we have an inspection type and what is here is a, a drop down pick list. And this really setting up these pick lists and modifying the content of these pick lists is very simple to do in the software and obviously having pick lists for fields like this allows you to you know keep really consistent uh, reporting, really consistent information entered into the field really limits what people, you know, some mistakes that are often made in terms of what type of information gets entered in the fields. But these pick lists that really limits it. And here, you know, we have a connection to all the suppliers that we have in our system. We're going to select Cooler Master as, you know, in this case. And then similarly, the non-conforming item. So in this case, I can either search by part number or by description. I'm going to search just by description and do a band sync for my non-conforming item. You get the results down here. Again, now I have a direct connection into that item in the system. I can add some additional information here in terms of quantities that are affected and stuff like that. Uh, the impact of this, again, it's another drop-down pick list, you know, forcing some consistency in terms of the results I get and allowing me to search on those types of, that type of information, make sure I'm getting consistent results and when I search for information. So this position, I have five choices here, one through five, and I have this X other, and I'm going to just pick rework in this case, but what I'm going to show you is, you know, that X other, I find that a lot of people are using that, and it, it's getting frustrating because the other doesn't really tell me anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the other. And I'm going to show you how quick and easy it is to update that information once we get to that. But for now, I'm just going to select rework. And here I'm going to select myself to be the responsible for the review stage and uh, the quality person for the disposition stage of this process. And I'm going to save this. In the meantime, what I'm going to do is go back to that that pick list. Now, I, I have administrative privileges, you know, which, which would be normal for you to have a business admin level person. It does not need to be an IT level person to do what I'm going to show you here. It's very simple. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to modify that pick list and get rid of the other selection because I just find that it's being happening too often. So what I'm looking at here is a list of all the pick lists in the system. I found out that it's the NCR disposition pick list that I need to edit to get that updated. And I see here is my selections available to me. I'm going to delete that and save this. And now when I go back, to, and so I don't have to reboot anything. I don't need to restart anything. All I need to do is hit refresh. And now what I'm going to go back and I'm going to edit that same non-conformance report I just created. And when I go to the disposition drop-down field, I see that that's no longer available to me. Um, so, you know, on my last PLM system, doing something as simple as that, you know, required IT support, it required taking the system down after working hours or even on a weekend and rebooting everything, getting everything back up and running to make a simple change like that. Fusion Lifecycle doesn't require that. You know, being a cloud-based tool it really allows you to edit a drop-down pick list very quickly and easily like that. You hit refresh and, and within a, you know, a few seconds you're back up and running uh, with the information, the updated information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the workflow for this non-conformance report real quick. And processing things through a workflow here is if you have permissions, which I do, I can tell that I have permissions because I have a green arrow available to me, and I can select that I'm going to submit that to the next stage. It's a very nice interactive format. It really is clear on what you have available to you as a user and, and what stages you're in. Now I'm currently in the under review stage, and I can now either approve it or return it. And I'm going to say I want to get this into the approved, so I'm going to get into the disposition stage of the non-conformance report. Um, one other thing that we are finding in this example is the non-conformance reports are kind of sitting in this disposition stage for a long time. So something else that Fusion Lifecycle allows you to do is you can edit that workflow and, and send out notifications and things like that, uh, and then even escalations to address that kind of scenario. So again, back in this 
back in my scenario here, the disposition stage. We're doing a good job getting it reviewed, but we're not doing a good job getting it out of disposition stage in general with my company. So I'm going to go into this. Again, this would just be a regular business admin level person. You don't need IT level to do this kind of updates. This is the workflow for my conformance reports. And go into the disposition stage. I'm going to say I want to set up a reminder notification and send that out every day for five days when I get to the disposition stage because I'm, it's getting frustrating that it's sitting in disposition for that long. And additionally, I'm going to set up an escalation that after those five days, I'm going to send it back to the under review stage. Um, okay, I can only do that forward. So I'm going to send it, to, you know complete, I'm going to send it back, I can only send it forward in this case, so I'm going to send it to the complete stage at that point, but the point is you can really set up these notifications and escalations very simply in your system, so those are now set up, so that will help prevent me from sitting on this disposition stage uh, and, and getting it locked up and, and providing a bottleneck in your process. Another pro quality process that we have in here is the RMA, Return Merchandise Authorization Process. I'm going to go into this example, RMA01. And again, what we have here is in this details area, we have a link to the product that's been affected by the RMA. You know, the serial number information. We have a, a different team here. Again, so the RMA has different teams. It has different stages of approvals required for the RMA process. Since it's in a different workspace, we can set up a unique workflow for just RMAs. And then importantly here, we have a reference to the CAPA. So in this case, this RMA then ultimately resulted in a CAFA being generated. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I wanted to show you the approval workflow here. And we have some notes in this approval workflow which shows who can approve only one approver is required for each one of these three stages and who that person should be. In this case, quality technician, quality engineer, and then design engineer. So when I set this up, I can provide multiple people that can do that, but only one is required. And then as these people approve it, they will show up here in the approved by field. So again, providing really good traceability and auditing capabilities on these types of RMA processes to get uh, information down the road in the future. Another thing I wanted to show here is, and I know we don't, you know, accessing a PLM system and getting access to live data all the time is a real benefit. But one of the things you can do is sometimes you have to get this information printed out or sent out externally, say, to a supplier. What we can do is there are print views set up here in the system, so these are very easily configurable also. You can have this kind of document created, the print view set up, print that information out and get it out to maybe third party or external suppliers in this case. So again, so now we have our RMA. The RMA is generated to Kappa. There's a link to that Kappa, so I'm going to go into that Kappa. Now again, I see that this, the state of this CAPA is it has a pending ECR, and then the information associated with this CAPA is all in all these fields down here. We have, once again, a variable team that can approve it at the two different stages that this workflow has, the definition of the CAPA. There's quite a bit more information in the CAPA form, and setting up these forms in the fields is something very simple to do. It's very configurable in that way. And you can see here in the interim containment plan, now I also have a connection to a deviation and waiver form. So now I have an RMA. I'll get down to this in a second. Now we have the causes shown here and a permanent corrective action. So now I see a connection to a change request in the system. And there's some additional information in terms of implementation and validation stages and preventing reoccurrence and now references. In the reference field, I can see that I have that related RMA that we had seen you know, just a second ago. So I have, in this one cap, I have a relationship to the RMA that created it. I have a relationship to the change request that's been generated as a result of the CAPA, and I also have a relationship to the deviation and waiver. And that is, you know, really the fundamental, one of the big fundamental benefits of quality management and PLM and connecting all of these different processes, you know, that can very easily exist maybe in silos as it has you know, my personal experience, these types of things were in silos often in the past. And then very difficult to drill down through all of that information. So if I go into the workflow for a cap, I'm going to see something else very key here. Is It's a similar workflow, but again, it's different for the CAPA process than it was for the other two quality 
workflow processes that we had listed or shown. And here this note is, is the important note that I wanted to highlight is that the capital will be closed automatically by the completion of the related change request. So I go back here, I have a related change request, and when this change request gets completed, it's going to complete the capital. And that's the connection that you can, you know, you can build that level of connection between all these processes so that they automatically generate from one another and that they automatically close each other out as they get approved and completed. So now we are in our change request in the system and we see that that change request, you know, again, has a link back to the kappa. But it also has a link to the change order. So the, the RMA generated the kappa, the kappa generated the change request, the change request generated the change order, which is here. And then that change order is going to close out the change request, which will close out the kappa. I think you kind of get where I'm going with all this. All these processes are connected together and, and can automatically populate fields from one to the next as they get created and they can automatically close each other out as they get closed out and completed throughout their workflows. Some of the reporting capabilities in the software, real quickly, is, you know, here's a list of all of our reports we have in here, the QM stands for quality management. I'm going to just use this, this all open non-conformance reports, and this is just a simple list, but again, this is the type of information that I, as an engineer, struggle really a lot in my career to get access to, and especially accurate information. I don't know how you guys might be doing this today, but if you're doing this, you know, and manually updated Excel spreadsheets and that kind of stuff, this is access to live data, so I am only going to see truly open, active, non-conformance reports in, in a very quick manner in a couple seconds. I'm able to get that information and trust that is reliable and accurate in my PLM system. And then I can go into each one of these individually just by selecting on this little plus sign. Another report that I'm going to run here is NCRs by per supplier just to see if I'm having any particular issues with a supplier. And I can see that I'm having some issues here with the Cooler Master has five open NCRs. So it kind of highlights to me that there are you know, some potential issues going on there with that supplier specifically. I know that was a really quick overview. There's a lot to quality, but I wanted to get at least some of the key fundamentals of the of the quality processes, and those were the, you know, the quality workspaces that we have available right out of the cloud for you to use, and some of the functionality with those. So hopefully what I, you know, hopefully what that highlighted a little bit was the first and foremost closed loop link processes, again, with all of the different processes being able to be connected to each other and drive data field generation from one from the other, and then actually be able to close each other out as they get completed. Um, traceability, aiding compliance information, um, the third bullet point there, documents being managed directly and contained directly in the process. The example where I had the attached photo, you know, whether it's a Word file or a PDF file or whatever it may be, but having those files directly all connected together in the process and not stored on some network drive separate from the actual process itself is a real benefit here. Uh, planning inspections and effectively dealing with that, you know, new in a new product introduction process or something like that and getting all your first article inspections planned properly and early on in the process and reporting. And the last one would be involving third party suppliers directly in the process. You know, it's something I didn't really show too much of in, in the demonstration, but you can get third party being a cloud based solution, it's very easy to get third party personnel uh, directly involved in some of these processes. So if it's important to get your supplier information about some of these RMAs or, or the non-conformance reports specifically, you, know, you can get them involved in that process. So some customer success in terms of who's implemented Fusion Lifecycle successfully in the, the industries that they're in and what the companies are. This is just a quick uh, brief summary of some of those companies and the industries that they're in. And then here are just some quotes from some of those companies. You know, the second quote there does mention that they've, Corex has been successful with their quality management processes and getting that into Fusion Lifecycle. And where to find further information, there is an Autodesk website dedicated to Fusion Lifecycle. You can get a lot of good information there. And there's also a YouTube channel. Uh, the address for the YouTube channel still references the old name PLM360, but there's a lot of good short videos on there if you want to research some short brief topics and things. There's some, some good short videos on the YouTube channel that you can explore uh, when you have some time. And with that, I would like to open it up to some question and answer session. 
Again, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat window. Um, I didn't get to any questions while I was doing the presentation. A couple did come in. Um, but if you have additional questions, please, now would be a good time to enter them into the chat window. I will address the couple questions that did come in during the presentation. Uh, the first one is, what if I don't have a CAFA process? Can I still, can my processes still be connected together if I don't have, you know, I guess what that's probably referring to is, I go back up to this. And yes, you can. This is all very, Fusion Lifecycle is very configurable. Between the workspaces and the connections you build between those workspaces is extremely configurable in how you do that. So if you don't have a Kappa process in place at your company, that's fine. You can connect the RMA directly to change requests if you want and non-conformance to change requests. Or whatever configuration and connections you want to build between the workspaces, the software is extremely configurable and allows you to make whatever connections you want between all of these workspaces. So it is not by any means required that you follow this this model and that you have these workspaces in place you know, in order to connect an RMA to a change request. You can go directly RMA to change request. And then the second question that had come in was about third party suppliers and getting them directly involved and, and how does that work. Um, so how that works is if you get enterprise licensing you get unlimited third party, what's called third party licenses. And with third party licenses, especially since it's a cloud-based solution, that allows you to get a third party supplier, for example, access into your PLM system to you know, maybe approve a workflow stage or get them their non-conformance report, get them to access the non-conformance report directly. Um, this was you know, a big stumbling point for me in my last PLM system was third party access into the system because it required additional license purchases and it was a big investment and getting them through our firewall and, and all that kind of stuff was a real problem for us and we never were successful, at least at the time I had left, of accomplishing that fusion lifecycle. This is extremely easy. It's free, for one, and two, it's cloud-based, so it's very easy to get people, external your organization, access into the system. Um, so it's a real big benefit. We just completed a project at a customer uh, that that was you know, one of the real big selling points for them to get their suppliers directly access, directly direct access into their system to help with the supplier approvals. Um, and, and you know they're very pleased with that particular ability and, and the free licensing associated with it. Uh, those were the two questions I saw come in during the presentation. I don't know, Dave, if you have any others that had come in while I was addressing those. I haven't seen any yet. We'll just give it a couple more seconds. Just in case somebody's typing a long one. And feel free, if something comes up afterwards, um, you can reach out to your account manager or myself directly. I'll make sure, that even if I'm not your account manager, I'll make sure somebody does help you out. Um, you can feel free to email me at that dave.hampton, H-A-M-P-T-O-N, at synergist.com. So I think what we'll do is we can wrap it up here. Um, we really appreciate you investing time with us this morning. I hope you uh, were able to take away um, some valuable points and, and everything regarding fusion life cycle and quality management. Uh, again, you will be receiving a recording of this uh, link to the recording. 